I've known George uh, for a long time as a mentor uh, and as a friend, I would say, as well, and as an excellent, amazing human being. So George has been many, uh, many, many different type of excellent uh, personalities. Uh, you will hear about him in different ways from different people. We will also hear about him as uh, the person who started together with Jean-Marie Lusier and Karl Stadelhofer the endeavor of the Merak Prices. Jean-Marie will talk about that specifically later. But I want to start by introducing the person from the beginning. So I, I like to think of George as really a champion of thinking out of the box and a pioneer of bringing computational science to astrophysics. He has had a lot of uh, influence on the early development of computational astrophysics and cosmology. He has been the founder of the N Body Shop, and Tom Quinn will say more about that, having been another crucial component of the N Body Shop since the early stages. This was an initiative that started uh, at the University of Washington when George uh, became a faculty there in the mid 90s. And the Embody Shop has been a place where many first things were done, first times in the business of computational astrophysics and simulation. It's been the, the first uh, time at the Embody Shop where a process called galaxy harassment uh, was modeled with computer simulation and shown to be uh, a very important and effective way of transforming galaxies across different types of morphologies. It's also been uh, the place where the first simulation showing the well-known substructure problem, missing satellites problem in cosmology were carried out. It's also been the place where uh, the first very large N, so very many, many particle uh, simulations of planetesimal disks were created and carried out. It's been also the place where a new way of modeling asteroids called the rubble pile uh, model was developed. So George uh, received his Bachelor in Physics and Astronomy uh, at Averford College and he got his PhD uh, in Physics from Princeton University. And at the time, you know, he was mentored by people who were already uh, very influential and established in astrophysics and cosmology, such as Jim Gunn, uh, Jerry Ostreicher, and others. He held postdoctoral positions at UC Berkeley and also at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. Then uh, he spent some time as a staff uh, research scientist at the at and Bell Labs. And then uh, at a similar time, he also held a visiting membership at the IAS in Princeton. In 1985, he became faculty at the University of Washington at the Department of uh, Astronomy where he stayed for many, many years. That's also where I met George the first time. And uh, in 2000, so after 15 years of being a faculty at UW, he branched out into a different field, into computational biology, and he became a professor and a CEO at the Institutes of Science and Biology, which was at the time in, in Seattle, and in general, one of the first biotech companies uh, that was entering that discipline of computational uh, biology. And, and it's just a, a funny side, but uh, when I uh, was hired by George as a postdoc for my first postdoc, this was in uh, 2000, and then I moved uh, to Seattle uh, after the PhD in 2001, but when I arrived, he had just moved uh, to ISB. Uh, this was typical of George, sometimes it was uh, unpredictable, but in a good way, because it's ironic, but as he moved, we actually were getting together very often, so he mentored me, even though he was not at UW anymore. And so then, uh, later on, George came back to astronomy, after this parenthesis at ISB, and uh, he became a professor, William Ben Professor of Theoretical Physics at Washington State University. And then in 2005, until his retirement in 2018, 
he was a professor at the University of Zurich, first at the Institute of Theoretical Physics, and then in 2013, uh, he uh, founded the Institute of Computational Science uh, at the University of Zurich still, and so he was the founding, was the founding director and he stayed there until, until retirement. So George, as I said before, you played a, a very important role in bringing computational science to astrophysics, and so trying to marry different disciplines while doing that. And one of the first big achievements that uh, he managed to uh, obtained was in 1993, where uh, he won his uh, NASA performance Computing and Communication uh, grant. Uh, this was a big team, but he was the PI of this big team of computer scientists, physicists, and astronomers. And this is how he started his initiative of uh, big, uh, large, uh, H, uh, uh, high performance computing uh, endeavors in, uh, in cosmology, uh, especially in a area of embodied simulations of cosmic structure formation. And I think uh, Tom will say more about this. This is a picture uh, of the team that won the grant at the time. So as I said, I, I met George when he was a professor at, at UW by the Department of Astronomy. Uh, but at the same time, when I got there, he had just moved to ISB. But still, before that, um, I also spent uh, just a few days at UW while I was still a student, and that's actually our first uh, direct interaction. This was where we actually met at the building. I'm sorry. That's the, the physics and astronomy building in, in Seattle. And then uh, very soon after we started talking, it was almost lunchtime, so he said, let's go to lunch. He brought other people together, and we went to this restaurant, the Little Thai, which is actually pretty famous over there because it's a very good Thai restaurant, but it's also extremely, the food is extremely spicy. For me, it was the, only, the, the second time, I think, that I had uh, Thai food. And, you know, I saw that George was very, very, uh, you know, easy on that and said, you know, you should order a five-star dish because these are the best ones. And so I, I trusted him, you know. It, it, he looked a very smart person who knew what he was talking about. So I went for the five-star. And, of course, you know, I almost died while I was eating. But it was a really the first challenge for me because it was to survive until the end of this super spicy dish while starting to hearing new things and trying to understand what he was saying because George was a very clever, very smart person. Sometimes he was talking in a way that was difficult to grasp right away what he was really meaning. And so it was really, really the first challenge, but I, I'm grateful for that because then we actually uh, made it extremely stimulating and, and was just the first of many stimulating interactions that I had with him. So when we got back, you know, after I, I started, you know, taking longer breath and being able to talk again in a normal way, giving out the spice, we started uh, talking about a topic that he uh, really had uh, in his art at the time. That was really the, the fact that, you know, CDM is scale free and things that happen in galaxy clusters should happen also in groups. All the dynamics should be the same because there is no no intrinsic scale uh, to make a difference. So they had worked uh, already at UW but, uh, on galaxy harassment. So he proposed that I should look at the same processing in groups. And that's exactly what became then later the, the focus of my PhD thesis, which was back in, in Milan, so not at UW, but he was one of the, the mentors remotely, if you want. And so that's the first paper that we wrote together and, and from then on, I mean, this interest in, uh, you know, galaxy evolution in, in groups became one of the themes of my research in the early times of the postdoc. So over the years, George has taught me many things, and, and these are just some of the lessons that he was uh, really giving for free. Uh, the first one was really to, to trust your intuition, but the intuition is not just, you know, uh, spontaneous thinking, but really linked to having in mind some very key numbers that should guide any kind of uh, thought and research that you want to do. And so these relevant numbers, the scaling laws, should build the intuition about things. And when it doesn't feel right, when something doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right. He usually was telling me this often. And so that was also meaning using always uh, evidence to judge whether some idea or some project was 
something sensible or not, and never get emotionally attached to an idea or a theory, but really stick to evidence. And that also means to beware of mainstream thinking, which is sometimes really giving you the false impression that you understand something where you don't, and beware of the theories. You like to talk about theories, especially the feedback theories. And I, I'll go back to that later, maybe other people will. Challenge always the ideas from the time you think about something new, think about immediately where it can break apart, where it can be falsified. And then also think big, be imaginative, but also be very concrete. So that was typical of George. So you, you would sometimes be surprised how it could be extremely um, creative and thinking about something you would never think about, extremely far from your normal thinking process, but at the same time, be very, very concrete and pragmatic. So he taught me a lot about grant writing, for example. You know, he was always saying, you, know, you can have the best ideas in science, but if you are not able to write a good grant proposals, you will not make a career. So that was really one of the, uh, the things that I learned from him, you know, how to write a successful grant proposal. And, and then also learn how to talk to other communities, so specifically, specifically with computer scientists. You know, and you know, he was joking by saying, yeah, you also have to find a way for them to work for you. And he was doing all this always in a very humorous and funny way. You know, he, he liked to be a wizard and also Santa Claus and many other, many other types of personalities. He was also very critical sometimes. He could be extremely harsh when he thought that something was really wrong or was giving the false impression that you had understood something while you hadn't. And one example is uh, galaxy formation simulation. So we collaborated on that uh, through the years, but we also had harsh discussions sometimes and even some little clashes. And in all these cases, in the end, he was right. One example is in the mid-2000s, different groups, uh, including the group at UW and you know, collaborators elsewhere, uh, we had started working on simulations of galaxy formation that managed to get some objects that were looking like these galaxies, whereas before it was no way. You know, there was this so-called angular momentum catastrophe where nobody was able to get nothing else than an early elliptical galaxy. You would not get disks. But then someone started getting disks. We were some of these groups doing that. But then, you know, we claimed success too early, and George immediately recognized that, and he pointed out that, well, at most, we were able to make sombrero galaxies, but we were not making any M33, where he had in mind M33 is the prototypical this galaxy with no bulge. And he was right, because in the simulations at the time, we had no analog of a pure disk galaxy. And this remained to be the case for a long, long time. And so he was always saying, you know, you're just be a bit luckier. You, have, you haven't done anything smarter. You're just being a bit luckier because you're using Lambda CDM now rather than CDM. That gives you a bit more time and slightly larger halos, so you get a bit more angular momentum, and you end up with some disk. But that's not the end of the story, and it's still not yet, even now, the end of the story. And it would be probably a bit disappointed to see when sometimes the claims in galaxy formation are overly positive and over, over claiming success. So I will uh, end by saying something that will be said even more and uh, better later by uh, others, uh, that George also told me a lot about the importance of supporting young scientists, which is really relevant for the Merak Foundation and the Merak Prizes, uh, really to support them as a mentor and also as a promoter. And this means especially being intellectually generous, meaning if you have ideas, you should just give them off to them. If you think about good projects, you should suggest to them, give up on leading, and have them lead. And then with this, I will leave it to Roger, who will talk about the early days uh, of George in astronomy. Uh, thank you, Lucio. Um, it's lovely to have those photographs back up. Can we put just one photograph of George up there while I'm speaking? That would be nice. Oh, yeah, yeah, just. Thank you. Just any photograph would be nice to have. That's good. Oh, this one, fine. Thank you. So, um, 
I got to know George very early in his career. Uh, he and I more or less exact contemporaries. Um, first of all in California, where we were both postdocs, and then we both moved from California to Cambridge. So I had the privilege of knowing George for just about 40 years. Uh, I first met him in 1979, while I was a postdoc in Santa Cruz, then a rather isolated island of interest in galaxy work, actually. Um, I just finished my PhD on the dynamics of elliptical galaxies. George had been constructing numerical and analytic models of prolate galaxies. And he was working on the predictions that the theory of tidal torques give uh, for the angular momentum of galaxies as a function of mass. So we, we had lots of things to talk about, uh, but he was in Berkeley. But, um, uh, oh, but before I leave that topic there, I've already mentioned two or three topics there. Each of those topics gave rise to single author papers that George wrote in those early days. So he really was a pioneer in this area. So um, in Berkeley, of course, he, there he was in Berkeley. I was in Santa Cruz. Um, but there was a more traditional path for Cambridge uh, students to go to California, and that was indeed to go to Berkeley. I, I had a lot of friends in Berkeley, people who'd been my contemporaries more or less. And so I used to spend several weekends uh, in that year I spent in Santa Cruz in Berkeley, uh, and I actually stayed quite often in George's apartment. George's apartment was uh, very much the social center of uh, the young postdoc group. Um, and I, have, I recall very clearly, you know, George is a very imaginative person. He had lots of zany ideas about things, not just astronomy. Uh, and we uh, enjoyed lots of uh, lively conversations and fun events as a group of young postdocs. So then uh, we both returned from, well, I returned from, from California to Cambridge, and he joined the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge, as Lucio described. And it was here, really, that I got to know him best. Um, it was a fertile time for his research. Um, he continued to work on dynamical problems in galaxies, uh, including early models with dissipation with Ray Kahlberg and Colin Norman, on merger remnants with Alan Dressler, and perhaps most famously now, his work on dwarf galaxies started then with some work on uh, the H1 uh, rotation curves of dwarf ellipticals uh, then with uh, Bob Schama and Jacqueline van Gorkum. Uh, at that time, Cambridge was a real hothouse of galaxy evolution work with many of the future leaders of the field there as uh, the cadre of postdocs. So along with George, uh, either on the staff or visiting, was Ray Karlberg, Bob Schama, George of Stathew, Simon White, and many others. Um, I, I contacted Ray Karlberg uh, in order to uh, get a full re recollection of those years from him. Uh, He's a, he was a good friend of George's, and, and uh, I, I just wanted to give you one quote from, from Ray. Uh, he said that working with George was always interesting, always challenging, and ultimately both fun and rewarding. So then after our time in, in Cambridge, we both moved to the United States. Uh, I moved to the National Observatory in Arizona, and he moved to Bell Labs, and, and then on to the University of Washington in the 90s. And, of course, we continued to interact then at conferences, and, of course, he visited Tucson quite a bit in those days. Um, and when I returned to, to the UK, uh, this time to Oxford, in the, in the late 1980s, uh, just a couple of years later, George came with his young family, uh, Joe and Astrid and Caitlin, and spent a sabbatical year in Oxford. And it, we both had young families in those days, so we did lots of family things together, and so that, that was a really lovely time. Um, it, he was, again, at a very productive stage in his career. He was then, he by then really uh, amplified his work on dark matter in dwarf galaxies, and also uh, his famous paper on gamma rays produced by dark matter was written at that time. So uh, then, of course, uh, decades more or less pass. I, I, of course, see George now and again, and it's lovely to be in his company. Uh, but, of course, I was able to reestablish the connection with George when he was involved centrally in setting up the Merak Prizes. Um, and getting to know George again, as it were, was really easy because a, a long-lasting 
friendship um, w w w that, that was already established, it was easy and fun to remake that connection. So uh, I, I have to say, looking through the photos that Lucio showed, um, I, I, I was going to say this anyway, but it's particularly apparent given this picture up here. I, I really just can't help but recall George's rather mischievous smile, uh, which I have to say I still miss. So I certainly miss him. He was a wonderful person and made some terrific contributions to our subject. Thank you. We will have Jean-Marie Lusier for the Merak Foundation, and we'll also say a few words. So, I'm happy to, to be here to talk to you about uh, the f formation of Merak. Uh, I'm not talking about the star, which I couldn't do, but about the foundation you heard about and uh, of uh, George's role uh, while uh, forming Mirac. Um, you can imagine the level of excitement and uh, the intensity uh, we had during the first board meeting uh, of the Mirac Foundation in Zurich, uh, where I uh, met George for the first time. So, uh, Founding a new foundation uh, for uh, the fostering research in astrophysics and cosmology was, of course, a great event. It was in winter 2011, uh, and um, we were three of us. So Karl Stadelhofer, who is here, the president, uh, George, of course, as the scientist, and myself as the financial uh, and a bit uh, strategy uh, guy. Um, uh, when we uh, met at that time, uh, the bylaws of the foundation were uh, already defined, so the basic principles to follow were clear and uh, simple. Um, and the name was also set up, and we had uh, an idea of the annual budget we could uh, spend on prices and, uh, and grants. But apart from that, everything had to be defined, and uh, of course, it, uh, it was very important to have George with us to, to think about uh, how we could set up a price and a foundation on such a topic which was a bit far from our uh, uh, normal uh, way of thinking and habits. And very quickly, Joel proposed um, a framework complete and explained uh, why and how it would impact the global uh, astronomical uh, society in Europe, which was the, the aim of the foundation, because we, Merak is uh, here to foster European research by young scientists. Um, and uh, you know that uh, George very quickly came with a three price uh, agenda, so uh, every year. Uh, you know, three prices, theoretical uh, astronomy, ob observational astronomy, and uh, instrumental and computational uh, state of the art. So, uh, we were very soon uh, and very quickly convinced by his proposals, and um, so uh, then it had to be put in place. Um, George was especially very keen in uh, instrumental, computational, uh, multi-messenger uh, activity, so, so it was very important also to have this prize. He got in touch with uh, EAS uh, very uh, quickly in order to uh, get them um, in the adventure and to define a collaboration. And Carl was also very involved in that, uh, in that step. He, they uh, had a lot of talks with Thierry Courvoisier, who was uh, the, the president at that time. 
And um, that way, the um, memorandum of understanding was uh, written. Uh, it was signed in July 2012. And, uh, of course, very important, the scientific committee was set up. And uh, I, I take the opportunity to thank the uh, scientific committee who made a, a great job during these 10 years. Um, George also um, designed and proposed, uh, with the help of some students, the logo of the foundation, so we see the creative uh, part of George here in, in action, with a cos cosmic microwave background and a beautiful logo. Um, in order to, to launch the uh, foundation uh, in Switzerland to, to have the, the necessary uh, uh, low um, uh, requirements, uh, we had to, to, to launch a, a specific activity in Switzerland very quickly, and this was uh, with the Exoclime first uh, project that uh, this activity in Switzerland get, uh, got place. Because you have to know that Merak is under the supervision of the Swiss Confederation, so uh, Interior Ministry. And this project, of course, was proposed by George. Uh, at that time, we learned a lot about, uh, for example, uh, how much the exoplanet uh, sector was boosting and how hints of life uh, on these faraway planets could be tracked in the future, although we learned a lot more today in, about this field. So, uh, thereafter, George maintained uh, the ongoing relationships with the EAS and he made sure that every year scientific committees would work smoothly and he was uh, regularly advocating increases in prices, although we were here to resist uh, his wills because of uh, budget constraints. Uh, sometimes we gave way, but... Uh, we had to uh, refrain a bit. Thanks to George, we had uh, regular uh, meetings um, and briefings on the evolution of the scientific field, which was important to, to take decisions. As you understand, we were only the three of us with uh, some administrative support, but it's uh, a, a very light uh, so, uh, structure in Merak. And uh, we would, uh, this way, understand some uh, of the new tendencies or more, most uh, exciting discoveries. For example, he told us about uh, future big orbital ob observatories. It seemed science fiction, to, science fiction to us, but now it's reality. Um, he talked about uh, gravitational waves detection and new uh, obje observational field uh, linked with it, which was also very new at the time, and, but now it's uh, becoming probably mainstream. He was, also, he was also, I remember, very excited about the TRAPPIST solar system, and uh, we had mails about uh, was it a fluke or was it reality? Uh, it seems it's reality. Now, when George became ill, he continued nevertheless to work to the, for the foundation with a lot of energy, and he courageously gave us the name of pot potential successors. Um, and uh, so, thanks to George's wisdom, uh, which is, I think, a word that applies very well to George, uh, we now are happy to have uh, Lucio Maya. Uh, on the board of, the, of Merak, and uh, I thank uh, Lucio very much for, for the two days of the session we had. Uh, very excellent. Thank you very much. I will as always remember my discussions with George, uh, him showing me the huge market of uh, the JWST uh, at the Pra Prague Congress in. Uh, in 2017, I remember, 
and also us talking about the relationships between physics and psychology, especially the discussions between uh, von Pauli and Jung uh, long, long time ago in Zurich. Uh, he was very uh, keen on that kind of subject also. So uh, this work with the foundation has been for Karl, I think, and for me, the occasion to encounter a very uh, um, far-reaching spirit of George and to appreciate greatly the work with this, uh, with this man. Uh, and as, as you said, it was not always very easy to follow all the ideas, but we did our best. Um, and I recently uh, learned more about this breadth of George's intellectual dynamic and the impact he had, and uh, so I'm very uh, thankful also for this brilliant biography which was given by uh, Lucio, and uh, I think we will put it on, uh, on the Merak side anyway. So that's it uh, for the Merak uh, formation with George. Thank you very much. And now Tom Quinn, give you the picture, this one, right? Let's... Yeah, so I'm going to start, uh, pick up the story, uh, basically at this picture. So this is the, uh, the, the co-investigators on the uh, High Performance Computing and Communi Communications NASA Grand Challenge grant that George got um, starting in 1993. So the one thing to notice about this picture is that uh, there's only, well, there's George and there's two other astronomers. They're way in the back. That's uh, Jim Bardeen and Craig Hogan in the back. But the other, others in the picture are not astronomers. You've got three computer scientists and an, an applied mathematician. So, and that sort of brings out one great point about George. He was one who could bring diverse people together in an organization. And so he was the one that, that brought this group together and started this, this large project, which eventually became the End Body Shop. Um, another example of uh, bringing people together related to this is about, as we started the, this uh, project, George instigated what we called the End Pizza Problem. So this was a pizza lunch uh, where we had end pizzas and end people to eat them. Uh, but there were, again, we were bringing both computational astrophysicists, computer scientists, even people from industry. We had the, the CEO of Cray Incorporated, which was in Seattle at the time, come and, and, and participate in these lunches. We had molecular dynamics. We had granular dynamics. We had material scientists all giving uh, talks uh, in this, uh, this pizza lunch, uh, which, although it's not talks about end body problems anymore, that pizza lunch continues to this day in the Department of Astronomy at the University of Washington. So, uh, in this project, uh, there were a few initial hires. I was one of them. Uh, another was Ben Moore currently professor at the University of Zurich. Uh, another one was Joachim Stadl, also a professor at the University of Zurich. Uh, there was Neil Katz, uh, currently a professor at the University of Massachusetts. And so it, it was quite a stellar group, uh, if I can include myself in that, uh, uh, that, were, that was brought together by George in that initial uh, a formation of the, of the Embody Shop. Um, since that time, uh, that uh, group has continued. Uh, according to the Slack channel, uh, we have 160 participants worldwide that, uh, you know, loose collaborations across the world, uh, continuing to this day, but initially started by George. Another point, uh, you know, getting that, that going, uh, it's been brought up a couple times here, is, is George's sense of humor. Um, 
In, in this particular case, uh, it, it helped out our group uh, because it was a big project. We had to have a site review by NASA headquarters. So these folks from NASA headquarters came out in their suits and ties, rather stuffy. George had the idea, oh, let's take them t out to an Ethiopian restaurant, which is not only very spicy, but you have to eat with your hands. So after that lunch, coming back to the department, the jackets came off, the ties were loosened, and it was a much friendlier review uh, in, in the afternoon. Um, George had a generous heart. Uh, as he was successful in getting these resources, both resources for personnel and computational resources, he was always uh, generous uh, making sure everybody had the computational uh, uh, resources that, that they needed. Um, and, and of course, helping myself find resources for my research, mentoring me in writing proposals, um, as Lucio um, mentioned. But there's not also only the professional generosity, there was the personal generosity. So when this group started, actually 30 years ago, Last month, uh, I, I flew from England to Seattle with my wife, Carolyn, who was uh, seven months pregnant at the time. And when we landed, there was, it was Ray Carlberg who was there to pick us up at the airport, drive us to a house that, that George had found for us, and got us settled into a community, uh, brought us household wares, you know, dishes and things like that to set, set up our, our, our little family. Um, and indeed, you know, a few months later, the child was born. We had only been in Seattle for a few months, and it was time for my child to be baptized, and George was there um, at his baptism. We didn't have um, many other friends in Seattle at that time, so George was taking care of us, and he was literally... Uh, the godfather of my oldest son. He continued supporting my family, coming by in one of his cars, either the Mazda Miata or that big 1969 Plymouth Fury III. Um, some pretty wild car, cars that he had. Let me talk again, again about mentoring, right? He mentored me in writing proposals, he mentored me in faculty politics. Not sure if that was so successful since I'm now the chair of the department. Um, but he promoted me as a young researcher, both within and, and without uh, the university. And, and, and you know, frankly, uh, I don't think I would be in astronomy today if it weren't for George. It's hard to talk about hypotheticals but I don't think if it, were, if it were for George, I would probably not be in astronomy, astronomy much less uh, being a faculty at the University of Washington. So thank you, George, and I honor your memory because of this. I leave it now to Arif Babur from Victoria and give you the, that's your starting pitch. What do I do, just the screen button? Green and right, back and forth. Okay. <clears throat> this is getting to be difficult. I have to actually let Tom know you are absolutely right about that last bit that you say. I have had many conversations with George about that. He played instrumental role in pushing your career forward, as he did with all of us. I mean, it was just incredible. This was a man who was, I chose to use a f words that people don't normally use. He was a rainmaker. He was a visionary. He could see the future of computational science, not just computational astrophysics. He could see that computational science was a thing before people realized that it was a thing. And he, you know, 
put his energy into astrophysics, but he also put his energy into computational biology. It wasn't an accident that he got associated with ISP. He has written papers on computational anthropology, if I remember correctly, and uh, you know, he could convince granting agencies to fund him and take a risk when we all know that granting agencies are incredibly conservative. But he could bring you around in, in a way, and as many of you know, he had a habit of talking really fast. And so before you realize what you're agreeing to, you've already signed on the dotted line. And that was his, one of his greatest gifts. He was a wheeler and a dealer. I mean, literally, he would not take no for an answer. Uh, if there was a bureaucratic obstacle, for him, that was just a challenge to work around. Um, he, that, that particular part of him played a, a major role when I first came into George's orbit about 30 years ago. George became a mentor, and you've heard about how he has, uh, he, you know, he really and genuinely gave off himself this idea that I'm going to share my success, but more than that, I'm going to teach you how to be successful. There are definitely the art of doing science, but there's also the art of writing, as you've heard, grant proposals and navigating bureaucracies and maximizing opportunity. This really was his gift and, uh, that he handed over to all of us, and there are so many more of us than that you see on the stage. Uh, and then, over the years, George became a very dear friend, and I think that of all the things that I miss, it's that friendship that I miss the most. Um, people have said that they, you know, they, that 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 George, you know, did this in science. I, while I was writing this talk, I decided to look back and see how many papers did I actually write with George. I mean, I've spent thirty years and gazillion hours with George. I've only written one paper, and that was right at the very beginning. Um, Everything else we've done, you know, has been mentorship, teaching, friendship, and just gener generosity of, of a form that, you know, I have not come across in other people very often. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit with you. Little known fact, George is entirely responsible for the supercomputing landscape in Canada today. So I was, I had just moved to, well, first of all, when I, when I was at NYU, I had just been awarded, and this is how I started to really come into George's orbit, and I learned uh, what kind of wheeler dealer he really was, and that this was a guy I should really be taking notes from. Um, I was at NYU, I had just been awarded, I think three of us, right? You, Tom, myself, and Neil Katz. We had just gotten a really large uh, NASA grant, and I was leaving NYU to cross the border where I can't take the money. And George came up with a way to maximize opportunity. The best part was he didn't take the money and use it for his own benefit. He actually held it and parked it so that we could really make use of it. That started my career in, in, in simulating uh, groups and clusters. We actually ran the very first simulation uh, using n-body resources of a cluster of galaxies with cooling. And, 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 you know, the rest is history. But along the way, because people at UVic figured out that I was doing computational astrophysics, they roped me onto these committees to try and convince the government, the universities, and, 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 and the granting agencies to start funding computational resources. And we needed referees. And guess who the referee was? George. And as I just finished saying, when George starts speaking, nobody can withstand that tsunami. And before they know it, they had funded, you know, the UVic supercomputer. Next thing you know, they're funding Westgrid. And I know for a fact that George was on the, on the refereeing committee for the uh, Compute Canada, which many of us are still taking advantage of. For those of you who are not familiar with this image, this is a cartoon uh, character, George, Curious George. 
I, I brought it up for two reasons, because first of all, it really does remind me of George. George really was this guy who was curious about just about everything. I mentioned to you that you know, he's, he's worked on computational biology, computational anthropology. What is more is that I was interested at the time, I used to talk to him about computational neuroscience, and he would say to me, why aren't you writing papers on that? I, I have to make a career in astrophysics. Oh, they don't pay you enough to be an astrophysicist. Do what you love. And so over the years, I actually started to uh, write papers in computational neuroscience. More than that, he convinced my wife. He became a mentor to my wife. And then later, he became a mentor to my daughters on, on aspects of computational uh, you know, um, economics, uh, computational neuroscience, and, uh, and, and basically network sciences, it, it, ultimately. There's another reason why I want to bring this up. Curiosity aside, we used to read Curious George to our children, and our youngest one was about two years old, or about a year old, when she met George. Now we said, we're going to Seattle to meet George. Little did I think, she had already made a connection in her head. And so when she first met George, we stayed with George in Seattle, she walked around saying, Curious George? Curious George? And George, this is where I started to see the, the humanity, the, the human aspect of George, the, the, the generous man that he was. He didn't blow her off. He sat down and started to make faces at her. And this was the outcome. They became the closest of friends over the next few years. So this, you know, he absolutely loved children. And the last, among the last memories I have of George are this one, where he's playing with his grandchildren in his, I guess this was the last month, um, and he just adored them. And he was so delighted that he had an opportunity to do this. So I think it's important that as much as we're going to hear about him as a scientist, we hear a little bit about what kind of a person he was. Oh, there's a missing slide here, Lucio. Okay, that's okay. Let's, I'm gonna, this was a slide from Yola and George's wedding. So of all the things that I have encountered over the years, probably the saddest for me and my wife was the fact that George's personal life was not as fulfilling as he had hoped. But I remember, I think this was 2010 or something like that. I, I can't remember when he met you. Um, but I remember him coming over to Victoria. He was literally bouncing, uh, couldn't contain himself. And, and not Victoria, he came to Vancouver. And he came over to see us, and he was just bursting with energy and radiance. And I remember my wife sitting down with him and said, George, what's wrong? What's going on? He said, I met a woman. And that was Yola. And he had fallen madly in love with her. And it was amazing to see him in that state. But I think the picture that's missing here is a picture from his wedding, which I wish had been up there. You could literally see George deeply in love, deeply uh, enchanted by Yola, and he's just bursting. And that was probably one of the happiest moments in our lives, to see him so fulfilled. So, with that in mind, I'm going to, you know, having shared with you a little bit about George as a human being, you've heard everything that I would have said in more detail from others, so there's no need to repeat. I, I want to leave you with just one little uh, clip, because I don't want to leave you on a downer. It's, it's, it's been a sad moment as I've heard, heard stories, so hopefully this.
that was George. Fun-loving, happy, crazy, generous to a fault. And uh, I think he's left an indelible mark in all of our lives. Thank you. Prasenjit Sakhanau, continue. Let's see. Oh, that was, they changed, they changed the order somehow. Okay. Let me do that. So, if you've uh, noticed the garish shirts which most of us are wearing, I suppose it's not difficult to guess why. Um, and uh, I wanted to share with you uh, uh, not actually uh, personal stories, though I, though I have many to share, but another aspect, which is um, George as a living presence who continues to make us think. And, uh, uh, well, I've written about an oracle, and an oracle, as you know, is um, someone who say something which is very cryptic, very difficult to understand, but you know it's profound. And uh, uh, somebody, I didn't hear this particular sentence myself, but uh, some, uh, um, uh, another person who would, would be visiting Dan Dorazio, whom you may have run into in another session, told me a few years ago that, oh yes, George, um, I remember him saying, thinking back several years, the sun is about one electron volt, and I've always wondered what it was. And it was a very, a very George-like statement to uh, come up, come up with some uh, such a random, random-sounding statement. But then, kind of, we got curious and actually plotted up approximately a solar spectrum. And what you see here is, uh, well, electron volts, and then, uh, well. 10 to, the, 10 to the 21 photons per second per meter square per electron volt. And sure enough, the solar spectrum, or approximately the solar spectrum at, at the Earth, photon flux at the Earth, does peak at uh, one electron volt. And when you think about it, it's, it's not a coincidence that um, uh, solar cells are typically made of silicon because that's about where the band gap of silicon is. Um, it's a, a, little, a, little, a little over one electron volt. So to make this kind of, make this kind of uh, connection, scientific connection between different things and then encapsulate it in this one cryptic sounding sentence is uh, very typical of George and it's, it's still something that comes back to us um, to make us think. There are more, but um, let me give you another aspect of uh, George as a scientist, um, which is that, uh, yeah, there are some ideas which he, which he had which are still to be explored, and here is one. He called it uh, Stars and Stripes, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, and, uh, yeah, if some... Um, and... Uh, this is on the, on, the, on the right is a picture which uh, George, oops, sorry, um, George would not have seen because it was only published in 2022. And it's a picture of the Milky Way with, uh, uh, with, with t tidal streams formed from um, the dwarf galaxies which were uh, interacted with the Milky Way and came into the halo and then were, were stretched into, into streams. Um, and that's an uh, aspect of a problem which uh, George had worked on, but these discoveries were made more, these particular discoveries were made more recently, most of them. And another idea which was, which was part of that was that not only the, the stars in visible, in, in, in visible dwarf galaxies would have formed these kind of star, uh, tidal streams, but the dark matter out of which the, we think the Milky Way halo is made itself would consist of uh, a very large number of these streams, uh, which would uh, not have homogenized. So depending on where you were, you could be going through a tidal stream, or several in fact. And 
most of the time you'd be moving with a typical um, uh, velocity in, in the Milky Way halo, hundreds of kilometers per second, and you wouldn't stay with the tidal stream for very long. But suppose it happened that you were in one of these tidal streams and not only were you located within, but you were moving exactly with the tidal streams. Um, what would happen? You would, you would uh, if you were the sun, you would uh, uh, collect a large, large amount of these dark matter particles uh, from the tidal stream simply because you were at rest with respect to the, with respect to the dark matter stream. And then George thought, um, once in a while in, in the galaxy it's going to happen, um, and you know, even if it's one part in one star in 10 to the 9, which happens to be within a tidal stream in phase space, uh, what would it do to the star? And then, here's something I'm guessing, George didn't mention it, he thought back to uh, some research uh, from the 1980s, and you may remember some familiar names here, David Spergel and uh, Bill Press. Uh, they were thinking of trying to explain what at that time was an unsolved problem of uh, the uh, solar neutrino problem and dark matter at the same time. And thought, okay, if the sun absorbs uh, a small amount of uh, dark matter through interactions with uh, particles, in the, particles in the sun, that would change the internal conductivity of the sun enough to change the neutrino spectrum. So he'd have explained the solar neutrino problem and dark matter at the same time. That wasn't the explanation for the solar neutrino problem as we know. But never mind, George, I, I guess, reached into that idea and he transformed it and thought, okay, uh, what if another star, not the sun, absorbs dark matter particles not as a result of interaction with uh, ordinary matter, but as, uh, as a result of being in these tidal streams, um, what would happen to it? Um, um, and what would happen to it is, I guess it would move somewhere in, in, in color, color magnitude, and you'd see these anomalous stars in a color magnitude diagram. Um, still an open question. Um, uh, please somebody take it up, tell us the answer. And please, if you do, do credit George. Thank you. Now, Justy Reed. Hi, thank you. And uh, obviously, a lot of wonderful things have been said about George uh, that I absolutely concur with. I first met George back in 2005 when I moved as a, a young postdoc to his then new group at the University of Zurich. And it was an incredible, uh, productive, uh, very creative and exciting time. There were lots of us uh, young postdocs and talented uh, PhD students coming up through the ranks uh, who were all mentored and touched by George. Um, he had a preponderance of really, really original ideas. In my own case, we did some uh, uh, really fun work on thinking about accreted dark matter disks in the Milky Way. And as others, that was a, a really uh, a turning point in my career. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's pretty safe to say that I also uh, would not be standing here uh, as a professional astronomer today uh, if it were not for George. Um, but I wanted to say a few personal words also about George as a person. Um, he's one of the most original thinkers uh, and one of the smartest people I've ever met. Uh, and the way his mind worked was really, really quite unique. And that stretched both from astrophysics right the way through into his personal life and, and uh, things he was interested in. Um, many of you who will know him, he, had, he, he would get obsessed about collecting things. He got uh, very obsessed uh, with, with cars. Uh, and of course, we know he was obsessed with space and cars in space. Um, and also, when he wasn't obsessed with cars in space, he had a particular uh, passion for collecting um, rubber ducks. So this led to me, whenever I went traveling anywhere, if I found a rubber duck, I'd bring one back for George to add to his collection. Although I don't know where they are all now, but I, I apologize for adding to the giant pile of rubber ducks that maybe now sit with Yola. Uh, <laughs> and um, 
He, of course, also was a real character, and we've seen some of this in, in some of the other talks as well. You'll notice today that we're all dressed in these uh, wonderful, bright Hawaiian shirts. That was a particular trademark of George, and we thought we'd honor him today with how he dressed. But when he wasn't wearing his Hawaiian shirt, he would relish any opportunity to dress up. Uh, here he is, uh, dressed as, I guess, a wizard version of uh, Elton John. And uh, uh, this, is, this was at a party, but on Halloween, he would come into work uh, even in Zurich, right, where it's not really a tradition, I guess this is a, I've never worked in the US, I guess this is a tradition in the US, but in Zurich he would be the only person on Halloween to come into campus fully dressed in, in full costume. Um, so, and, and he was absolutely cool about that, it's amazing. Um, and as we heard from Prasenjit, he would, uh, he would often speak in these rather cryptic proclamations, and we had the, the one here, solar cells just work because the sun is about one EV. And uh, Prasenja has kindly, in, in, with a graph and some time, unpacked that and explained it to us. Um, but this is the way his mind would work. And I found quite quickly that I became, I took on the role in his then new group as uh, sort of George, George's translator. And uh, the postdocs, and particularly the students, would, would quite often have these very short meetings with George where he would say things like this and then wander off. And then they would turn to me and say, well, what was that all about? Um, and it took me quite a while to figure it out, but I, I think George carried these enormous um, look-up tables and little nuggets of facts, but deep facts, not just little bits and pieces of information, but sort of deep understanding of ideas, as Prasenja alluded to. And he could very quickly connect these very disparate ideas in his mind, but didn't necessarily take the time to explain that thought process when then it became these proclamations. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that amongst all the many things that George has said, there's probably a very large number of ideas, not just stars and stripes, uh, still waiting for us to decipher, rather like uh, you know, the, the writings of Nostradamus. And I did wonder, like, how far back does this go? Is this just when I knew George? I think perhaps when you all knew George. And I stumbled across this, this, uh, this rather old photo of George on the whiteboard here, and I suddenly realized it's still there. Does anyone know what this is? It's, it's mysterious, and it's very, it's very George-like. So there could be, a, and probably is, a fantastic scientific idea somewhere in here. The C is very important. Uh, so if you can figure this out, there's uh, almost certainly a, a fantastic career uh, waiting ahead for you. Uh, I have not been able to fully decipher this one myself, but I will get to work uh, later this week. Let me just zoom in on that. Um, so that just leads me to say that, you know, as I say, George was a, a fantastic mentor, colleague and friend. He's been a huge influence on my career and that of many others. Uh, you'll notice that he, you know, he, he does rapidly become uh, close and uh, I'm, I'm very happy that he had a chance to meet also my children. This is my eldest son, Liam. He is now 12, believe it or not. Uh, and I'm sure George would have relished the opportunity to see him grow up. Uh, certainly had a chance to be there at uh, George's wedding as well. And um, uh, yeah, he's been a, a huge influence and he's very, very much missed. Uh, and I'm often and always uh, thinking in little moments of, of George and his uh, uh, proclamations and sayings, uh, one of which came up at dinner just last night uh, when we were talking about some recent results that I shall not name, where George would often say, a one sigma result is an oxymoron. Uh, and I think that's still a lesson we can probably carry with us today. So thank you. Now I leave it to Victor de Battista. All right, so you've already seen this photo. Um, I'm here. Um, George was not my PhD supervisor. He was, I never was his postdoc. Um, I've written one paper also with, with George. Uh, I'm really here as as an example of George's gratuitous kindness and generosity to people. Um, I, uh, I, I started with this photo over here. Uh, this is a photo that was on his CV um, back in 2016. We applied for some funding for a workshop on uh, dark matter disks um, and thick disks. And, and, um, it was a combination of myself, uh, Justin, uh, and a couple of other people, and including George, and I needed to collect CVs, and so there was this 
amazing CV from George, and at the top of that was this very smiley, happy face, uh, and that was sort of um, indicative of how George is, how George was, that he would be, um, you know, this informal person, very happy person to, to be around. So, um, I first met, met George when I moved from Switzerland, before George got there, to Seattle as a Brooks Prize Fellow. The Brooks Prize was initially set up by George. Uh, he, he had an opportunity to meet with, with uh, David Brook, who uh, was working in the software industry at the time, and they set up this fellowship, and I was one of the lucky people who won this fellowship. And George would periodically come through Seattle, and one time I cornered, cornered him and we started talking about what I was doing, I wanted him to know what I was doing. And at the time I was very intrigued by this particular problem, uh, trying to understand these objects, bulges of galaxies, the details don't matter very much. Um, but as I was talking about this, uh, I, after, after some time, after half an hour maybe, uh, I got the sense that he had sort of understood what we were trying to do, and from talking about the subject, we somehow switched to why is the Andromeda galaxy still forming stars? That was, for those of you who, who work in galaxies, that is a somewhat orthogonal direction to go in. That's a little bit like this oracle that we were just hearing about before, and it left me extremely puzzled, and I should have followed up on that idea because just a couple of years later, uh, our nearest galaxy, Andromeda galaxy, turned out to have one of these box peanut bulges that I was trying to find. Uh, so if I'd listened to the oracle, actually, that, that I might have uh, been able to do some work around Andromeda. Um, the one paper that we did work together, I wasn't even the second author. <laughs> I was the last author on the paper. Uh, it was this, this uh, paper that Justin led. Uh, Justin led, yeah. Um, and so after this paper, uh, I didn't interact with George, I didn't see George for quite a number of years, in fact. And the next time I saw George, I was going through Zurich, I'd been invited to ETH to give a seminar, so I was there. George came over from the university, and we started chatting, this was around 2015. And I told him that I was going to be taking, uh, I was going to be on sabbatical the next year. And he said, why don't you spend a few months here at the university? Um, and so I spent a few months at the university. And the very surprising thing about that is at the end of that period, he said to me, why don't you spend another sabbatical next year uh, for, for six months? Uh, so much paperwork later, uh, I was invited as a guest professor uh, to, to the university and I spent six months there. And those were really actually very productive. That was a really very productive time for me personally. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, that uh, later, but um, I want to tell you a little bit about the work that I did while I was there, and this became a theme that uh, I would do things, I would write papers from ideas that followed from things, and uh, George would be always acknowledged in, in these papers. This was a paper that I, I completed when I was uh, at the University of Zurich. It's a paper that I personally feel, think of as a career highlight because it explains a lot of things that go on in the Milky Way's bulge. Um, and so I was really able to do this. I was actually able to bring people with large data sets or data sets for the Milky Way, for the bulge, and also people who are very skeptical of this very idea. So I, this, having this time to actually work on this where I didn't have to worry about you know, teaching and so forth, the usual duties, uh, really was very valuable to, to me personally. So, there's a, a, an acknowledgement there for George. Um, at the same time, there was this workshop that I told you about before, Thin, Thick, and Dark Discs, that's what we called it. We held this at uh, uh, Monte Verita, there's George over there. Uh, we held it there, uh, we, we applied for funding, like I said before, and, and won that. Um, George really liked this venue because back in the 1920s or so, this was, I'm told, according to George, uh, a very bohemian area, uh, and he really liked the atmosphere of the place, so that was um, a fun place to bring a, a group of people to. Uh, and again, from that came another acknowledgement to George over here. Um, and 
I don't know what happened there. That should not be a question mark. Right. Um, okay. Um, going forward, so then um, the, this, this slide was supposed to show that one of the other things that that, that same year, uh, I didn't just organize one meeting, I organized a meeting, an international conference, this, this one much larger, and George was on the SOC of that. And in both cases, in both the workshop and in the case of this big meeting, uh, what George was really very passionate about is uh, award, uh, supporting junior researchers. Uh, we had a, a prize for the Escona meeting, uh, and we had a prize for the best poster also at this other meeting, which you're seeing just as a question mark here. Um, and then, um, from the Escona meeting, some years later, uh, the, this was a paper that came well, some years later this year, <laughs> earlier this year. Uh, this would have been a paper that would have also acknowledged George, but I, I thought it would be appropriate to dedicate it to George because I started thinking about some of these ideas while I was uh, on sabbatical, and it's only just now that I've managed to, to finish things. Without, without the sabbatical, I might never have, uh, without, without the sabbatical, it took me so much longer to finish this, so that goes to show you the value of actually supporting people on sabbaticals too. Now, when I was on the sabbatical, um, George and Yola very kindly offered for me to stay at their place. Uh, I didn't have to worry about these sorts of things. I really could just focus on what I wanted to work on. And uh, as Justin noted, uh, he had a big collection, George had a big collection of these rubber ducks. These are not actually two from his collection. I just pulled these off the internet. Uh, so, um, you know, eventually curiosity got the better of me. He's like, you know, George, why do you, how come you collect rubber ducks? And George's reply was that, well, because I'm a terrible person, but I'm a great duck, which I thought was a great quote. But I hope I've given you the evidence here that uh, you can agree with me that on one hypothesis, at least George was wrong. Um, oh, sorry. There's supposed to be a big cross going through because I'm a terrible person. I think I hope you can all agree on that. I think he was a great person, and I'm really happy that he was part of my life. Thank you, George, for uh, your influence on my life. Thank you. I think Roman Tessier will continue and put you back to the slide of George. So hi, so um, uh, I'm uh, actually I'm one of the last uh, person to have met George. It was in 2008. Uh, of course, like all of us, he, he played a very important role in my career too. Uh, so uh, I'm not wearing a Hawaiian shirt uh, because George was not wearing only Hawaiian shirts. Uh, so I'm here to remind you that. Um, so as I said, I, I, I met him in 2008. So he, he, he basically together with Ben Moore, he hired me to go to Zurich to leave a comfortable permanent position in France and uh, go to a non-permanent position in Zurich for a couple of years. Uh, and that was probably the best move I did in my life. Uh, and uh, uh, it was clearly under uh, the mentorship of George. Um, he's, um, I mean, George, in, in, in my recollection, George is a political animal, was a political animal. Uh, I've seen him uh, overturning decisions during committee meetings, uh, and it was quite spectacular to watch, um, as uh, was already explained multiple times. Uh, and it's, it's probably why he managed to secure for me a permanent position in Zurich. Uh, he probably overturned uh, many committees' decisions for that. Um, so he was, um, he was a mentor for me, but I, I, I could watch him being a mentor for many, many people. Uh, and I think that's, that's why, uh, you know, having him funding this Merck Prize is uh, quite logical for me. Um, that's what he did, uh, you know, during his entire life, mentoring people. Um, so when I moved to Zurich, um, one thing I was uh, shocked to watch was that, uh, for me, George was this uh, rock star in uh, cosmology and galaxy formation. Uh, and so I, I was attending the very first kind of uh, journal clubs uh, in Zurich. And then I could see him talking about 
red giant branch stars and blue stragglers. And I was like, what, what, what's happening, right? So uh, th this guy is supposed to be an expert in galaxy formation. He's talking about weird stars. And so I was totally confused. And that's actually the idea that George is so eclectic in his scientific interests. And uh, that was uh, quite refreshing to see. And that also changed my mind about you know, what should be a career in, in astronomy. Um, so uh, George was a legend in HPC, and uh, uh, so high performance computing, sorry. Uh, and uh, computational astrophysics. Um, so for me, that was my, my career path. And uh, George was uh, also quite uh, amazing to watch uh, in terms of how intuitive he was about a lot of problems. Um, so in particular, he hired me in Zurich uh, because he was a bit uh, dubious, suspicious about the you know, te uh, techniques that were used by a lot of people here. Uh, to model galaxy formation and uh, in particular hydrodynamics, uh, which is the other aspect of galaxy formation that we're trying to use in our simulations. And so there is this idea that smooth particle hydrodynamics might have some limitations. And so he probably decided to hire me because I was a more serious guy doing adaptive mesh refinement simulations. And so he had this, this amazing quote uh, about the two techniques uh, who are still competing to this very day uh, to explain the properties of galaxies. And so SPH, so I'm calling George, SPH is good at hydro um, until it gets there, meaning that it's perfect for gravitational types of problem, but then for hydro it's less good. And uh, AMR is good at hydro after it gets there. And that's the idea that uh, AMR is good at hydro, but not really good at gravitational problems, right? And so the, the challenge of galaxy formation is that you need to combine the two and to this very day, I'm, I'm sure it's one of the uh, unsolved mysteries, is uh, you know, how we form uh, galaxies in our universe. And so uh, I think George has a, a very uh, amazing intuitive vision of all this. And uh, to this very day, we are still uh, you know, uh, following uh, his uh, main ideas uh, for the future. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's it. Thanks. Now Andy Burkhardt is coming on stage. Yeah. So this is a small note of someone who didn't work with George at all. And no, no paper, I think we are on one decadal white paper or something like that, but that's it. But I want to demonstrate that George's influence went far beyond just the people he worked with. And we met once in a while in Zurich or in, in meetings. And I, whenever I got together with him here and there, it changed my view of the universe a little bit. And for me, it was especially the nature of dark matter. We, we discussed a lot and uh, the cusp core problem of dark matter halos, and uh, we, we, we joked about the idea that we want to understand the universe and we don't even understand the nature of dark matter. How can you dare to do any numerical simulation if the basic ingredient you don't even understand? And uh, so we had these discussions and uh, then there came up this observational problem that the dark halos don't um, look like, uh, at least it appears so, as the numerical simulations lead to. And for George, this was extremely exciting. I said, George, aren't you now destroyed? Uh, no, just the opposite. Oh, much more fun if it doesn't really work. And then he came up with a list of at least, I would say, 20, 30 ideas of what it all could be. And uh, you could work many lifetimes on, on, on his ideas. So at the end, we always thought about who will figure it out. And uh, I think we agreed on that, that we astrophysicists um, get the evidence about dark matter, but at the end, a particle physicist has to work it out. So we'll never get the Nobel Prize for it, obviously. Yeah. So that was uh, basically my interaction, and it has influenced me a lot, and you know, one of my most cited papers is about dark matter cores, and it was influenced by George. And um, so in that sense, uh, just let me, uh, let me tell you that 
You know, you, sometimes you meet human beings and they get into the room, they stand in front of you, and you feel the personality and you feel this sphere of influence and you get impressed by, by the wisdom and the kindness. And I'll always will remember George like that. So the last speech of today uh, will be done uh, through a recording. Uh, Elena Dongi could not be here, unfortunately, but she will remember George uh, in a different way. But before uh, I play uh, a recording, I wanted to go back to something that we announced very briefly yesterday during the plenary, and that's the new initiative uh, of the Merak Foundation, which is inspired completely by what you have heard uh, about George. It, we think that this new award that we are launching this year uh, really encapsulates uh, what George would have uh, proposed uh, for supporting further uh, new ideas, uh, especially in the direction of innovating in the methods for astrophysics and cosmology. So that's why uh, we call this new award the George Lake Award, and it's the Technology Innovation Award. Uh, the first call uh, will be this November, November 15. And this award is not a prize, so it's different from the Merak prizes. It's not supposed uh, to recognize past work, but it's supposed to fund new work through a lump sum of 100,000 euros to serve as a seed funding for a new initiative that has to be geared towards uh, innovative uh, methods in instrumentation, in computation and simulation, and also in data analysis, including, of course, artificial intelligence methodologies. So I'm, I'm really uh, happy to announce this, and uh, I would like to thank immensely the support of the Merak Foundation, of Jean-Marie Lusier and Karl Stadelhofer, who are here, who uh, immediately found uh, enthusiastically uh, the idea of uh, moving forward as fast as possible with this new award, which of course uh, will always be um, run uh, in collaboration with the EAS. Um, so the first call, as I said, will be uh, this coming November, and we hope to have the first award decided uh, by February of 2024. Uh, the award uh, will be given of every, uh, uh, even here, so the next one after this call will be, uh, the next call will be in 2025. Uh, there will be a, a project proposal to be written, but a very simple one. Uh, for those who are interested, the uh, explanation of the uh, application is already available on the Merak Foundation website, uh, where we have a press release that is reported here. And there will be a very simple process uh, where essentially you will uh, fill the application form, provide all the documents uh, indicated on the press release, and uh, this will be then um, submitted electronically directly to the Merak Foundation. Now, one point that I wanted to uh, emphasize also is that this uh, award uh, is such that people uh, even up to 15 years from their PhD uh, are eligible. And the reason why it's a, it's a longer uh, time scale compared to, say, the, the Merak prices, is because we, we know, we are aware, and actually George in particular, remember, was often telling me about that, that people who uh, focus their careers on developing methodologies, uh, they often have less papers, so they appear to be uh, in the surface less productive, but they are actually doing work that is instrumental to most of the community. And so uh, in order for them to really you know, gain momentum, they need often more time, so that's why we decided to uh, have an extended uh, timeline uh, for eligibility. And so uh, with this now, I will uh, go ahead with uh, playing the video recording that Elena uh, sent us to remember George. With this presentation, I want to remember George Lake. My name is Elena Dombia from the University of Wisconsin Madison, and uh, I really want to start with the dear George, if uh, you were here, I just want to remember three roles you had uh, in my career and also in my life. Uh, George was my mentor. 
he was also my mentor, but also a scientist working with me, so a collaborator during my career, and I learned many lessons uh, from you, George. First of all, I want to remember uh, the ability of George to be an incredible talent scout, and that's what I learned when you know, I met him um, in the early stages of my career. I also want to um, uh, highlight uh, um, ideas that George uh, inspired me with uh, and uh, papers, a couple of papers we worked together and uh, we published together and also the lessons we learned through those papers. I met George when uh, I was an undergraduate uh, student and actually a PhD student at the beginning of my career in Italy and I met George in Seattle at the University of Washington and I was very very young at that point. He was one of the first uh, people I met in science and I was extremely um, impressed and, and very um, intrigued by his mind um, and also by um, the fact that he was able to discuss about anything you know any possible uh, any possible uh, argument or topics so he liked to talk about astronomy but also talk about life talk about earth science uh, and, and talk about biology, so he was an incredible um, uh, sharp mind and I was very impressed as a, as a very young person at that stage. And then uh, of course after meeting him in the very, very early stage of my career, I had also uh, the pleasure and the opportunity to work with George at the University of Zurich when uh, I was at the turning point of my career uh, with a Marie Curie Fellowship. Let me tell you what the science was with George in my case. He inspired me a lot about the Magellanic Clouds. He was always coming every day to my office and, and telling me uh, we should really uh, talk about uh, and, and think about you know, how the clouds came into the Milky Way. And indeed, we wrote a paper that was very... Um, um, in, very different from what the mainstream in 2008 was about the Magellanic Clouds. So we basically uh, worked on a paper where we uh, supposed and we uh, hypothesized that the clouds would have come in a group of dwarfs. And of course, you know, for in uh, in this field, you know, for uh, for many years, for decades, it was thought that the clouds were actually uh, long-term companions. Uh, of the Milky Way, but uh, we uh, came out with the idea that they came recently in a group of dwarfs and they brought together, you know, a bunch of dwarfs that uh, would populate the Milky Way today. At that time, I have to say in 2008, uh, the paper was not well, very well received. And so uh, people had a completely different idea. Uh, and, um, and so it was difficult to get published, but eventually we, uh, we uh, came through it and uh, through the whole process uh, and, and, the, and the paper was, was finally published in, 2000, in, the, late, in the late 2008. Uh, so uh, the competitors and you know, other groups wrote papers against our result saying that you know, the only possible, um, only possible uh, dwarf that would have come with a large Magellanic cloud would have been the small Magellanic cloud and, and no other dwarf, um, and, and there was no uh, compelling evidence that basically other dwarfs uh, would have come uh, with the clouds. So the clouds would not bring uh, would not bring a, a group of dwarfs into the Milky Way. But in, but instead, years later, a few years later, in 2016, um, there was a discovery. So uh, a bunch of ultra faint dwarf galaxies. So you can see here in this plot that there is the large Magellanic cloud. And the small Magellanic cloud are the two dark blobs in the plot. Uh, the, um, all the gas around is basically the Magellanic stream. And then the red points here are, and the blue points are a bunch of ultra faint dwarfs that have been discovered in, the, in 2016. So finally, we made basically a prediction, and this prediction was, uh, um, you know, was, uh, was actually, it became true. Uh, um, a few years later uh, when new dwarfs, so it, it became clear that these dwarfs came in a group of dwarfs with the Magellanic clouds. Going through the process, uh, uh, 
George taught me really a lesson. We were laughing about these, uh, these quotes. Um, so he said that, you know, he reminded me, uh, this scientist, uh, I believe it was a biologist, Haldane, that um, mentioned um, the four stages of acceptance of a theory. And that's what we went through, basically. Uh, with, the, with the paper of the, of the, you know, of the Magellanic Clouds uh, as, a, as a, a group of dwarves. So uh, the first reaction to a new theory is that this is a worthless nonsense. The second reaction of the community is uh, this is an interesting but perverse point of view. The third reaction is, uh, okay, now this is true but quite unimportant. And the fourth stage we went through, actually, is that uh, at the end, the community says, I always said so. So we laugh a lot, a lot about this. And finally, a quote that George always had uh, with me was basically, um, was basically, if you want three opinions, just ask two astronomers. But the most important lessons I want to remember, George, is that uh, through the journey of talking to him, be his friend and you know doing science with him i think i learned who i am i learned from his generosity that you have to be generous with ideas and george has always been generous with ideas i learned to think out of the box george loved different ideas he was always all his life completely out of the box and i think what i admired of him is the love for beauty and his uh, uh, very high standards uh, uh, for beauty um, and for an aesthetic life. Thank you, George. I miss you a lot. And I think we, we can say we, we all miss George a lot, but it was great to be able to be with him for as much time as we could and, you know, share with him a lot of things. Thank you very much for participating to our lunch session in memory of George.